Five years ago, President Clinton spent a billion dollars when he sent some 20,000 American troops down to Haiti to restore the government of President Jean-Bertrand Aristide, who'd been overthrown by his own army. But to make sure that investment wasn't wasted, the U.S. has spent millions more in foreign aid to help that Caribbean nation's fledgling democracy learn to observe the rule of law. Fact is, the U.S. has spent more money in the past five years trying to establish the rule of law in Haiti than anywhere else in the world. But today, with the last U.S. troops about to leave, questions are being asked about how wisely those U.S. tax dollars have been spent. So we went to Haiti to see what the U.S. has gotten for its effort and its money. The short answer, not very much. At first glance, Haiti seems as lawless as ever. Dead bodies again being dumped on the streets of Port-au-Prince, with police nowhere in sight. Assassinated just this year, a Haitian senator, and the leading candidate to supervise the nation's police. Meanwhile, Haiti's courts remain chaotic and overwhelmed, and the jails are bursting with people never convicted of a crime, while drug traffickers roam free turning Haiti into a major conduit for illegal drugs entering the United States. Former Justice Department attorney Marie Zucker, an expert on court reform, went to Haiti four years ago to help a U.S. government contractor launch a justice reform program there. But today, Geiger is one of that program's harshest critics. Democracy is not a walk in the park, right? I mean, it's a lot of hard work. Uh, the only thing is, Mike, we all make mistakes, but healthy people and healthy institutions try to learn from those mistakes. Uh, here, it seemed to me that when they made those mistakes, they just keep making them over and over and over. To learn what went wrong and why, we took a look at the Justice Reform Program, one of the most vital projects funded by the U.S. Agency for International Development, or USAID. To help with our investigation, Maurice Geiger took us to the National Penitentiary, which houses about half the nation's prisoners, many of whom are supposed to get legal help paid for by U.S. tax dollars. How many prisoners in here? About 1,800. It was built for between three and 400. These cell blocks hold pre-trial detainees, those still awaiting trial. In the whole penitentiary, nearly nine of every 10 prisoners have never been tried. And they live yeah. in there? And they can't even lay down to go to sleep there so many. They take turns. How long have you been here? I've been inside since 1996. Three years? Do you have a lawyer? No. No, no, first I've seen a lawyer. We heard the same story everywhere we went. You have to understand, Mike, there's virtually no such thing as bail in Haiti. So if you're accused of a crime, you're going to go to prison to wait trial. What crime are you accused of? To this day, I have no ideas. This teenager said he's been behind bars for two years since he was 15 years old. Many of the young men, who may very well be innocent of any crime, remain suspended in bureaucratic limbo, where prison files that should show why they were jailed in the first place are either lost contain no accusation of a crime, or simply never existed. And this is called pre-trial detention. Three months, nine months, two years, three, four years, pre-trial detention. We reported what we had seen to Phyllis Forbes, who for the past two years has run USAID's office in Haiti. I spent two to three hours today uh -huh. at the National Penitentiary. Right. It was disgusting. Right, but, but you got in. The stench was unbearable. Yeah. Some of them, they say, and I have no reason to disbelieve, have been there two, three, four years in pre-trial detention. Why? Justice isn't working right. And they don't have lawyers? Right. This is justice? You went to the jail. They let you in. We know who's in there. They get food from their families. Most recently, the, the Minister of Justice is, has been sending uh, doctors in. Um, this is definitely better. They don't have lawyers. Well, you know, I, I can't answer that. I, I, I don't know what their situation is. I don't know which uh, prisoners you were talking to. So I don't know if that's true or not. But prompted by our interview with Mrs. Forbes, 
Her office did its own investigation of the National Penitentiary, and they confirmed what we had seen. Of those in prison at the time of our visit, only about 3% had received lawyers through AID, though they say the percentage had been much higher. So who specifically was supposed to be providing these prisoners with lawyers? It was this firm, Shecky and Company, a Washington, D.C.-based consulting firm that AID had selected to lead its justice reform program in Haiti. Michelle Jacob now oversees the program. I have an MPS degree in international agriculture from Cornell. And you are not a lawyer? And I am not a lawyer. Jacob thinks the legal aid program has worked just fine. Yes, uh, it has been a success. Uh, looking strictly at numbers, we accepted about 15,000 prison cases. What they say is they've done a very good job on getting people out of jail who don't belong in jail. Well, if that's what they say, that's just nonsense. It's not at all uncommon to spend uh, a year or two years waiting to be tried for a case for which, if you're guilty, you'd only go to jail for 30 days. Geiger, whom Checky calls a disgruntled former worker, says he quickly concluded the firm simply wasn't right for the job. Well, I don't think they understand the subject matter of, of judicial reform. And yet they got the contract. Well, that's right. And I, and I don't USAID. think... From USAID. And I don't think that the USAID mission here understood the subject matter either. Geiger couldn't believe it when he heard about plans to computerize the Haitian courts, which have no windows, no doors, no telephone lines, no electricity. We obviously thought that was stupid and uh, said so. The computer enterprise never saw the light of day. And while outside evaluators did approve of some of Checky's work, they questioned the company's efforts to help Haitian courts track their cases. Without a good case tracking system, prisoners, like the pre-trial detainees we saw at the National Penitentiary, get lost in the system, stuck in jail with no way to get out. An outside evaluation team found that Checky apparently did not carry out what USAID intended. An outside evaluation team said that? Yeah. Could you give me the quote from the outside evaluation team that said that? The evaluation team found that the Checky system does not monitor the progress of a case through the criminal or civil process as a true case tracking system. We were at the very beginning of this work uh, and we did not, uh, at that time anyway, we certainly would not dispute the fact that we had a long ways to go. We had just started. They have definitely improved the case, the, the record keeping. I can show you pictures of what these courts looked like before the checky has been working in. Oh, be careful. Why? Mrs. Well, we can show you pictures You went and, and of case management. We visited one of the busiest courts in Port-au-Prince, the only such court in a neighborhood called Carrefour, serving nearly as many people as live in the city of Miami. We asked the clerk yes, there to show us his that. case management system. And he did. Checky and Company calls its filing system a success. Files without numbers stuffed into drawers. I mean, it really. A little bit like a short order kitchen where the chef has gotten mixed up. Yes, well, no doubt uh, for us, the Port au Prince is always by far the most difficult place. Uh, there's uh, shortages of everything, including clerks, including judges. So, what you see. Uh, is not necessarily surprising. Maurice Geiger says he's not surprised how Checky and Company's record-keeping system turned out, given the background of the man who helped set it up. His name is Jim Smith, a mysterious figure who, to the surprise of nearly everyone who met him, wound up as a top executive for Checky in Haiti. By all accounts, Smith was friendly and a hard worker, but... He didn't know anything about judicial reform. Didn't know much about Haiti either, so... I, I didn't know why he was in that position. When Geiger voiced his concerns about Smith and where the program was heading... Uh, we were told, uh, just shut up and uh, it's none of your business. Well, that just made Geiger even more curious. Who exactly was this American teaching Haitians about justice? So Geiger did what no one at USAID or Checky had bothered to do. He investigated Smith's background and made a stunning discovery. He had been uh, disbarred from the California bar, uh, and he had been disbarred because he had been uh, convicted of several felonies. And 
the felonies were defrauding the United States of America. So how did a man who defrauded the U.S. government and had been disbarred, he has since gotten his license back, how did he end up on the U.S. government payroll teaching Haitians about justice reform? The only U.S. AID official who would talk about it was Mrs. Forbes. She was not there when Smith was... Do you know about his background? Do you know about his history? I, I can tell you what I know. What do you know? What I know is that... Uh, he worked for the uh, civil, civil affairs. He was a re uh, reserve army officer. He was a convicted felon mm -hmm. who was disbarred, mm -hmm. hired by Checky mm -hmm. for a major job in the justice reform program of Haiti. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on. Well, <laughs> Mrs. says Smith kept his background a secret from Checky and USAID. When we learned of Smith's background, we gave the information to USAID in Washington. And they told us, don't tell USAID mission in Haiti, and don't tell Checky, we will check this out and figure out what's going on. Then we assumed that he would be gone within a few days. But nearly four months later, Smith was still on the job. Finally, Geiger told Checky and Penny about Smith, who was forced to resign. Later we learned that it was USAID which had asked that Smith be hired in the first place. AID declined to talk to us on camera about why they wanted Smith hired or why they told Geiger to keep Smith's felony a secret. Mrs. Forbes says the Smith fiasco should not obscure AID's achievements in Haiti, such as training and educating judges. I think Czech has done a very good job. And under very difficult circumstances, she says, including to work with an unstable Haitian government and a society with no democratic traditions. They do not yet have justice, though they have more of it than they had four years ago. Bill O'Neill used to run the United Nations Human Rights Mission in Haiti. He's worked in some of the world's worst trouble spots. You know Haiti. Poverty, violence, brutality, corruption, disease. Is the justice system really at the top of the Haitian citizens' agenda? Surprisingly enough, among the Haitians I deal with, it is. I might, if I were in their shoes, I might have other things at the top of the agenda, like food, a house, schools. But the Haitians I know all say the number one thing they want is justice. People looking in, why should it make any difference to them? whether or not there is a justice reform in Haiti. Well, for a couple of reasons, but if no other reason, because we're paying the bill. And I think most Americans work hard for their money and therefore work hard for their tax money. And they are willing to help poor nations wherever they are, but they are not willing to have the money wasted. I think that's uh, what they wouldn't like. USAID is now selecting a contractor to run the next phase of the justice reform program in Haiti, scheduled to begin in January. And Haiti's justice minister, Camille LeBlanc, says that this time he wants the Haitian government more involved in the program. 